We're going to be looking at chapter 1, and uh, I'll read verses 1 through 4 and give you some background, a bit of, the, bit of background, and uh, basically just get into our study. Habakkuk chapter 1, beginning at verse 1 and reading to verse 4, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore perverse judgment proceeds. We begin by seeing what he refers to as the burden. We know that Habakkuk was a prophet. He was one who ministered during some of the very dark days in the history of Judah. You need to remember with me for just a moment that the nation of Israel originally was 12 tribes. But the king of Assyria had entered into the nation and actually taken 10, the 10 northern tribes, into captivity. And when that took place, that left the two southern tribes called Judah. They continued to, uh, to exist until Babylon, under the rulership of King Nebuchadnezzar, came in and under three excursions into the nation, ultimately decimated the nation of Israel and uh, took into captivity for 70 years the people of Judah. Habakkuk was a prophet who was ministering during those days. It would seem that he prophesied during the reign of a king, a king of Judah by the name of Jehoiakim. We know that he reigned somewhere from 607 to 597 B.C. And he is the one who was reigning when Babylon came into Judah and took them captive. When you look at this, uh, this book and you notice as it opens the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, I think his name is something that we ought to look at for just a moment because it gives us some insight into the ministry of this man. Habakkuk is a Hebrew word that means to embrace. It also can mean cling, but it's also used to speak of one who wrestles. And Habakkuk is a wrestler. In the first chapter of Habakkuk, he is actually wrestling with the Lord. It actually has him wrestling over the ungodliness of his people. Because the times are difficult, Babylon is on the ascendancy, and Judah doesn't seem to care. And Habakkuk is wrestling over that. We know that during his day, God was using other prophets to speak to the people and to cry out warnings to them. We know that there was a prophet by the name of Zephaniah who was prophesying during the same time. We know that Ezekiel and Jeremiah all were used of the Lord to prophesy to the nation during the same period of time. Yet the people were not listening to their words and they refused to turn away from their sin. And so he's, he's burdened. The Bible tells us here that he's, he's burdened by the ungodliness of his people. He saw the hard-heartedness and unrepentant attitude of his nation, and it's weighing him down. And it causes him so much sorrow that he actually asked the Lord, how long am I going to cry? The word cry there doesn't speak of him crying as if he's shedding tears. It means how long am I going to shout out to these people? How long am I going to be crying out? How long will I cry out? And you aren't even listening. Now in Psalm 94, verse 3, the Bible says that uh, the psalmist said, Lord, how long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? In other words, why aren't you doing anything? How come I can see something going on? You've given me the opportunity, the eyes to see. And I see that there is injustice. I see that there is pain. I see there is suffering. I see that your people have hardened hearts. And I'm crying out. And you don't seem to hear. You don't seem to respond. Now, I realize that none of us in this room have ever asked God, how long until you do something? But Habakkuk sure, surely did. I believe that this is a common reaction for somebody who has a tender heart for somebody who loves the Lord. They see the godless way people live and they wonder if God's ever going to do something about it. And when they see God being mocked, there's something in their hearts that gets really upset. Turn with me for a moment to 2 Peter. I want to show you something in the New Testament as I'm laying a foundation. Second Peter chapter 2. And we'll look at verses 6 through 8. I'm laying a foundation right now, introducing this book. Habakkuk is somebody who's crying out, asking the Lord, how long am I going to cry? And it doesn't seem that you're going to do anything. I'm crying out, and it doesn't seem that you're listening. 
It looks like the wicked are going to continue to triumph and the, and the righteous are going to be just rolled over constantly. Now, that's not an uncommon reaction. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8 tells us that God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes. And He made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And it goes on to say, If He rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for that righteous man, living among them day after day, was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. He lived amongst the people of Sodom. And as he saw the things they did, and as he heard the things that they would say, the Bible says that Lot's soul was vexed, or it was tormented over that. There are people to this day who have not yet become so callous to sin that it doesn't bother them. There are some people today who still get bothered when they hear people using profanity in public places. There are still people today who have a problem turning on their TV and seeing underwear commercials that can cause a, man to, a married man to blush. There are so many things that go on that people have gotten hardened to. But many people, there are still many believers who love the Lord and want to see this nation become a righteous nation. And they still have their souls tormented. Be very careful that you don't become callous to what you think is just everyday life. Because that's one of the ways that the enemy begins to sow his seeds into our lives. By causing us to no longer have a concept of some very basic things like, like modesty. Like what it means to be a gentleman or a lady. You know, I have heard the newscasters speak about a guy who killed five different people and then he's referred to as a gentleman. From what I understand, gentlemen don't kill people. But we use the term gentleman in such a way today that it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't speak about you having any social graces or class or, or being polite or standing up when a woman enters a room or opening a door for a lady. It doesn't mean that anymore at all. We use the word lady for a lady who's been caught, a woman who's been caught in the act of prostitution. We refer to the lady who was caught. From what I understand, ladies don't engage in acts of prostitution. But we use the terms today so loosely that in many people's minds, you know, there really isn't a difference between righteous and unrighteous. This man, uh, Peter, uh, refers to, to Lot, who sees the, the conditions of the city that he's living in, and his soul every day is burdened by those people. We see back in Habakkuk that that's what's going on in his, in his heart. And when somebody's soul is vexed, when somebody is, is, is really touched by this, he's going to cry out to the Lord. That person is going to cry out to God. And, and they may even ask the question, Lord, when are you going to do something about this? Now, Habakkuk, as, it, as we begin our study here, Habakkuk was more than likely a priest before he became a prophet. How would we know that? Well, we have to rush to chapter 3. It's going to take us about a year to get there, so we ought to look at it. And the very last verse, the last few words of that verse, notice how he says to the chief musician with my stringed instruments. It would seem that he was a priest. Not only would it seem that he was a priest, it would seem that he was connected with temple worship. That gives us more insight into why he'd cry out to the Lord this way back in chapter 1. He would be a worship leader. And as a worship leader, Habakkuk would have a special sense of the holiness of God. Habakkuk would have a deep burden for the people of God to worship God in spirit and in truth. And this would be something that he would do, and it was his ministry to encourage others in this. He knew that God was a jealous God. He knew that God said to us that you are to worship no other God. In Exodus 34, 14, the scripture says, You shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Psalm 27, verse 4 says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that will I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. The psalmist in Psalm 96, verse 9, O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. You see, a worship leader desires people to enter into the presence of God and to worship Him in the beauty of holiness. That's what worship leaders are called by God to do. Now, of course, I realize that today many people get confused with uh, musicians and worship leaders. We have musicians who can sing skillfully and play skillfully and all, and they can sing worship songs. But there are others who are anointed to lead you into the presence of God to worship Him. You might find it interesting. The word worship is an old English word that is worthy -ship. It speaks about God's worth. 
And the Hebrew concept of worshiping God is an intimacy with God. It speaks about kissing the face of God. And a worship leader is an individual who has that intimate face-to-face -face relationship with God, who loves the Lord and has that kind of relationship. And that person is going to be in love with the Lord. And a worship leader, who is also a prophet, is going to have a burden in their heart to see God worshipped properly. Because that person knows that God is a jealous God and that he ought to be worshipped in the beauty of holiness. And so as he looks over the city and he knows that there are other prophets who have been speaking, Jeremiah, Zephaniah, and others, and he knows that the people have been not listening, even in, during the time of Isaiah, who cried out and prophesied and said 700 years before Christ, and he was saying, Babylon is going to come, it's going to take you, you're not going to repent, you're going to end up going into isolation and exile. Even though they were crying this out, the people weren't listening. And so this worship leader, who is also a prophet, is crying out to the Lord, and first he cries out to God, and he's wrestling with him. Again, Habakkuk means wrestler. And he's wrestling with the Lord, and he's asking God, Lord, how many, how many times am I going to look out in the society that doesn't seem to care? And your people are speaking out your word, and they won't listen. And you hear, but you seem to do nothing. When are you going to act, Lord? When are you going to move? And so he desired them to know God, to worship him. And so the heart of worship is being revealed here in his burden that the people are refusing to worship God. And so it helped to form a burden on his heart. And he speaks to God about his people's condition. Now notice Habakkuk begins with the phrase, the burden which the prophet, prophet Habakkuk saw. The word burden is a common word used by many Old Testament prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah. And Malachi all use the word in their messages. It literally speaks of a heavy load or a hardship. It can also speak of judgment to come. And Habakkuk has a burden, and he actually is beginning to question God concerning the people he's been sent to. He knows that God is just, and he knows that God is righteous. Yet God has done nothing to deal with sin. And so notice this question. Why are you not responding to what is happening here? How come you don't seem to notice, and if you do notice, you're doing nothing at all? He asks the question in verse 2, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear. Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Now I want you to notice that the heart of his complaint seems to be, and you might want to mark this, unanswered prayer. It seems to be unanswered prayer. I've been crying out, but you do not seem to take notice. The psalmist in Psalm 22, verse 2, said it this way. He said, O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. Has anybody here ever felt that? Lord, I'm asking for some, Lord, I'm calling out to you. How come you don't hear me? You know, I've done that many times. Many times I've cried out and I've said, Lord, and I, I'll be honest with you too. I, I have said, Lord, I know you see, but I do want to know why you don't act. Lord, I know you see, but how come you're not moving? As I read the Bible, it seems to me that you moved various times and sometimes even for less reasons than what I'm seeing right now. And yet, you're not moving right now. Lord, how come you're not moving? And that's what he's saying. He's saying, I see violence. I see iniquity. I see plundering. I see strife and contention. I see injustice. And you do not act to save. So why are they getting away with so much evil and you don't seem to take notice? I know that you're just and I know that you're righteous, yet you seem to ignore this. Because as we know in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 25, the scripture says, if one man sins against another, God will judge him. All of this has taken place, but Lord, you don't seem to notice. Now, as he's crying out to the Lord, and he says in verse 3, why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? Plundering, violence are before me, strife, contention arises, the law is powerless, justice never goes forth, the wicked surround the righteous, therefore perverse judgment proceeds, and he's laying out his complaint. And as he does so, in verse 5, the Lord begins to answer. He says, Habakkuk, shut up. No, he doesn't say that. He says, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded. For I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans are Babylon. I am raising up the Chaldeans a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. 
Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. So the Lord says, I am doing something. He says, look among the nations and watch, and you will be utterly astounded. The answer he gives is, the people will receive the justice due to them for their wickedness. I do not answer, because they are reaping what they have sown, and I honor my word. The reason that I haven't done anything about this is because I have stated that if they do what they're doing, that I would judge them. I have stated in my word, if they continue to live this way with no regard for me, that I would deal with them. Now let me give you a little history lesson so you can get a context of this. When Israel had asked for a king, God had warned them what that would result in. You see, when the Lord began to raise up the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel did not have a human king. The nation of Israel was called a theocracy. God was the king, and they didn't have a human king. And so when God was speaking to them and said to them, there will be a time coming that you are going to ask for a king, God said, let me tell you what this king is going to do. Let me tell you the king is going to do things that you're not going to like. The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 36 and 37, that ultimately what he would do is in their raising up a king, he ultimately would have to bring judgment on them because the king would no longer do the things that were pleasing to both God and man. Ultimately, what would happen is they would begin to follow the leadership of carnality. When they followed the leadership of one who was carnal, God was going to bring judgment on them. And ultimately, what he would do is he would bring in a nation that he would use to chasten them. And in Deuteronomy, as he speaks in chapter 28, it says, The Lord will bring you and the king whom you set over you to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known. And there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. You shall become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations where the Lord will drive you. Second Chronicles tells us in chapter 34, verses 24 and 25, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants, all the curses that are written in the book which they have read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be poured out on this place and not be quenched. As we've been studying Isaiah, Isaiah says this in chapter 39, verses 6 and 7, and he's speaking to Hezekiah, and he says, The days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget. They shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So the Lord is saying to them, You have rejected me as your king. You elected a king for yourself. In doing so, you're going to be led in a path that I would have never taken you, and ultimately I will judge you. This is the nation that's being spoken of here in verse 6 when it speaks of the Chaldeans. That's the nation of Babylon. And Babylon will have a military that strikes fear in the hearts of all they come into contact with. It's a nation, he says, that is filled with irritated, angry, and impetuous people. That sounds like the United States. Their military is intent on conquering the world and taking nations that they have defeated. He says to us, as you read this passage a moment ago, their military is terrible and it strikes fear into all they encounter. He says they are self-willed and they are proud. Their cavalry is as swift as a leopard, as fierce as a wolf, and they're going to swoop down on their prey like an eagle. And he's saying, and you cannot escape them. In verse 9, he says, they all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings, and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold, for they heap up mounds of earth and seize it. Then his mind changes, and he transgresses. He commits offense, imputing this power to his God. So he speaks concerning them, and he says, You know, they're like a hot desert wind. They are going to overwhelm you, and you're not going to be able to resist. He says they do not fear kings or princes, and strongholds can't resist their onslaught. They simply build siege mounds, and they climb over the walls. We know that in Jeremiah 25, verse 9, the Bible says, Behold, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, 
will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and perpetual desolations. And so they're going to come, he says, and they're going to overrun you. Now notice verse 11. Then his mind changes and he transgresses. He commits offense, imputing this power to his God. Their problem is going to be obvious. They're going to impute their success to a pagan God. Turn with me to Isaiah 47 for a minute, please. Isaiah 47, beginning at verse 10. The Lord speaking in this passage. For you have trusted in your wickedness, you have said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge has warped you. You have said in your heart, I am, and there is no one else beside me. Therefore, evil shall come upon you. You shall not know where it arises, and trouble shall fall upon you. You will not be able to put it off. Desolation shall come upon you suddenly, which you, which you have not known. Stand now with your enchantments and the multitude of your sorceries in which you have labored from your youth. Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you will prevail. You are wearied in the multitude of your counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save you from what shall come upon you. You gave yourself over to a false god. You've given yourself over to religions that basically are false. And in doing so, when your day of trouble comes, cry out to your God and see if He can deliver you. When your time of trouble comes, run to the times and open up the horoscope section and get advice from your astrologer and see whether or not they're going to be able to give you the advice that will save you from destruction. Because the Babylonians were a very proud and very willful nation. They had a priestly class that was called the Chaldeans. As a matter of fact, during the time of, of Daniel, Daniel being a righteous Jewish young man and having the Spirit of God in him, Daniel actually had become the head over the Chaldeans, meaning he had chief influence. And even though they were pagans, yet he was the one with the most influence in the nation. He was able to advise the king. And during his day, God was using him to advise the king, and God blessed him. The Chaldeans were a priestly class of people, and the people would look to them as being the wise persons. And yet God is saying that they're looking at you as if you're wise, but in reality, you are fools. In reality, you're unable to save. You have to be very careful who you put your trust in. And the Lord is making it clear that you can't put your trust into that which will not save you. So back in Habakkuk chapter 1 at verse 12, and continuing, notice what he says. Habakkuk is still wrestling, by the way. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. O rock, you have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours one more righteous than he? Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? You know what he's saying? He's asking the Lord, how can you use Babylon? They're far more evil than Judah ever was. How can you use these evil people in this way? Now, I underscored verse 13 because it's a constant reminder to me in my own uh, walk with the Lord. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. That phrase actually means in a literal sense... You cannot look at wickedness. You cannot look on evil with pleasure. You don't look at it with pleasure. You know, some people can see something that is really intrinsically evil and still be captive by it, still be captivated by it. There could be a beauty in it. There's a beautiful side of evil. But God doesn't see that. And he says, you don't have that problem. You see evil for what it is. And you'd never wink your eye to it. And you never ignore it. You see it for what it is and you avoid it. So how is it that you're going to use a nation more evil than ours? How is it that you're going to use Babylon 
to bring chastening on a nation that you set apart for yourself. Why would you do that? How can you use Babylon to judge us? They are more evil than us. And I've come to know you, and you've revealed yourself to me. You are holy, and you are eternal. But Babylon is evil, and you said you're going to judge them. And because your eyes cannot behold wickedness with pleasure, how can you use Babylon in this fashion? Continuing on, in verse 14, he says, Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? When he picks up verse 15, he says, They take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet. Because by them their share is sumptuous and their food plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? He's saying these are gross idolaters. When he says in verse 14 and speaks about men being like fish, um, why do you make uh, men like fish of the sea? He's saying, they're going to throw nets over us and drag us away. They're going to exile us and transplant us in another land. I need to ask why you're doing this to us, because they are gross idolaters and they're so much worse than we. Now, as so many righteous people in the past, the ways of God sometimes are confusing. And he's asking questions of the Lord because his ways are so very often mysterious. We've been going through Isaiah, but I'd like to remind you of something in chapter 55. Would you turn there with me for just a moment, please? Isaiah 55. I'll begin reading to you beginning at verse 5 in Isaiah 55. And notice what Isaiah writes. He says, Surely you call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for He has glorified you. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now for those of you who have been with me in Isaiah 55, you know that in Isaiah 55, an invitation had been given out. If you're thirsty, come to the Lord and drink. He said, all you really need to do is recognize that the life that you're living is unfulfilling. And all you need to do is realize that God is able to quench your spiritual thirst. The invitation that I'm giving to you would be a simple one, he's saying. If you're thirsty, come and drink. But when you want to discuss salvation, and that's what chapter 55 does, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. He says, my ways are not your ways. Why would you be saying that? Well, because... Just like uh, Habakkuk and others who have gone before us, there are times that we may have questions concerning the justice of God, the mercy of God, the judgment of God. There are times that you might see something happening and you'll ask yourself, or even the Lord, why haven't you, haven't you dealt with that? You might be the kind of person who's doing the very best job you can to raise your kids in the ways of the Lord. You get them up early in the morning before they go to school. You feed them. You make sure they're bathed and they're combed and ready to go. You pray with them, maybe even give them a devotion. You make sure they read the Bible before they go to bed at night. You do that for all of their life. And then they get to be 15, 16, 17, and they act as if they've never had a Bible study in their life. When you say, let's go to church, they say, I don't want to go anymore. I've been going and I'm bored. It's boring. And you say, well, come on, we need to go. And it's a wrestling match. It's an argument. And then they begin saying things like, well, when I'm 18, I'm out of here. When I'm 18, I don't have to go to church anymore. And your righteous heart is broken because you've done the best that you can to raise them in the ways of the Lord. And then you look across the street, and that's not a bratty little kid who used to, you know, ride his, his bike onto your lawn and, and make marks on it, is going to Harvard. Your kid doesn't even want to go to high school. And you begin to wonder, what's going on? His mom is never there, his dad is never there, but this is a good kid. What's going on? And you might cry out and say, Lord, I've done the best that I can. 
I've done everything I can, but it seems that every time I turn around, they're turning on some music I don't like. They're watching something on TV that I've told them not to do. They don't come home at night, and when they do come home, I smell their breath, and it seems that I'm smelling alcohol. Yet this kid down the street who's never even had a Bible study in their life is a good kid, a model citizen. His face is in the newspaper. He's an Eagle Scout. What's going on? And sometimes people can do that. Sometimes you can begin to wonder, what is happening? And how did this happen this way? You know, there's another prophet by the name of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, in chapter 12, verse 1, said something that re resonated with my heart. In Jeremiah, chapter 12, verse 1, this is what he said. He said, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. Yet, let me talk with you about your judgments. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? Lord, it's not that I don't trust you, but I think I need to give you some counsel. <laughs> because I look out there and it seems to me that people who ignore you, who have nothing to do with you, are not interested in you, seem to be doing pretty good. They're always fed, they have clothing, they have nice homes, their kids are good, and I'm just wondering what's taking place. So back in Habakkuk, that's basically what he's doing. He's speaking to the Lord and wrestling with the Lord over the Lord's judgment. He's wrestling with the Lord over how the Lord is dealing with the nation. He has said to him, listen, Lord, I have seen iniquity. I have seen trouble. I've seen plundering and violence. I see the strife and contention. I see there's no justice. And I'm wanting to know why. Why aren't you dealing with it? And God's answer is simple. Because I told you a long time ago, if you rejected me, then you would reap what you've sown. And you're asking me to not fulfill my word. I have given you my word for blessing, but I also have told you in your law that I would bring a curse on you. If you do what I say, I will bless you. If you reject what I say, I will deal with you. And the reason, by the way, I'm dealing with you is because I love you. I remember a story of a man who was uh, walking through the park with another guy. And as he was walking through the park, he saw two boys who were fighting. And as they were fighting and wrestling around, this man sees it and he walks up and he grabs this one boy and pulls him off the other one. And he shakes him and he hits him on the bottom and he says, now get out of here, go home. And the other boy who was on the ground gets up and looks at him and brushes himself off and walks away. And so after that ends, this guy says to the man who had pulled the kid off the other kid, he says, you treated that one kid really roughly, but the other kid you basically ignored. How come? He said, because the kid I pulled off was my son. Because as a father, I'm more interested in what my son is doing than I am in what somebody else is doing. And the Lord has a way of dealing with us because we belong to him. He chastens us because we belong to him. A father who doesn't chasten a child is not a real father. A child who is not chastened doesn't have a real father. And the Bible tells us that God will chasten those whom he loves. And that's why he says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. The nation of Israel has been rejecting the ways of God. The prophet Habakkuk, who's a worship leader and knows of God's justice and his desire to worship God and wants the nation to do the same, begins to question and say, God, how come? How come it seems that I cry out to you and I, see, I say, I see violence, I see plunder, I see injustice. I'm crying out, Lord, move, Lord, do something, deliver, and yet you're not moving. Why is that? And the Lord says, oh, I am going to move. I am going to move in such a way that if I were to tell you the details, it would cause you great pain. But I have a people that I've prepared. It's the nation of Babylon, a nation that right now is on the ascendancy and really hasn't made the impact that it ultimately will. I'm going to bring these people from the north. They're going to swoop into Judah. And in 605, 597, and 586, three excursions into, the, into the, uh, the, the nation, they are going to pillage, they are going to plunder, they are going to judge, and they are going to take you captive. But God, why are you using an evil people? They're worse than we are. Well, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I do the things that are right, even though you don't understand them at that moment. Because every time you get chastened at that moment, there's little understanding. But after, after a while, it, the scripture says, it yields up the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Because chasing for the moment is never pleasurable. 
But later on, it brings its result. That's why I'm doing that. I'm bringing them against you because I'm going to have to chasten you. I've allowed you to see this because a man after my heart, you're going to see that my heart is grieved by the condition of your nation. And so, Habakkuk, I'm going to show you something that is going to cause you to just absolutely blow your mind. I'm going to show you something that is going to ultimately answer all of your questions. And though we begin in Habakkuk at chapter 1 with a man wrestling with God, at the end we're going to fi find a man resting in God. Because when you begin to wrestle with him, he ultimately answers your prayer. And when he answers your prayer, he brings you into peace. And when he brings you into peace, that's where you rest. And what's interesting to me, and note this with me in chapter 1, he doesn't have an answer. Chapter 1 actually closes with him just waiting. He's awaiting an answer. And in so many ways, I think that part of the Christian life that we live, that is the most difficult part, is the waiting. It's the waiting until the Lord fulfills his word to us. As I'm growing older, and as I'm growing more experienced in the things of the Lord, I'm beginning to realize that sometimes the most precious time for me has been the waiting period, where my motives are being basically purged, where my heart is being refined, and where I finally can wait on the Lord knowing that in His time, He's going to move and He will do the right thing. Now, sometimes I will look out and I'll say, Lord, you see how our government has been? Or, Lord, you see our enemies have attacked us? What are you going to do about it? Oh, Lord, you see how the press is, is really enamored with this new faith here and and, and Christianity is still getting uh, short shrift. And, and I'm just wondering, Lord, what you're going to do? And the answer I keep getting from the Lord is the same one. You just wait. You just wait. You just do what I called you to do, and I'll take care of business in my time. It's not your responsibility to tell me what to do, the Lord would say. It's your responsibility just to wait for me to move. And when I move, you're going to see how all the pieces fit together and how I bring glory to myself. So you just wait. And I've discovered sometimes the most important portion of our prayer life is the waiting period. The waiting period in between the request and the answer. And that's how we end here in chapter 1. We end with him waiting for an answer. And he says in verse 17 again, Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? But you don't find an answer. You're told basically, wait. And that's what we're going to do until next week. We're going to wait. <laughs>